Good morning, my name is Rob Crane, and I'm standing in front of the beautiful Candia Congregational Church in Candia, New Hampshire. In 1838, this church was brand spank new, and it exemplified state-of-the-art church construction. Come on, I'll tell you all about it. So here we are in our lovely sanctuary. Um, to fully understand why this building was built and designed the way it was is we have to go back into time. So let's go, let's go back to the 1760s when the old meeting house uh, church was, was constructed. Uh, America was, was not even a country yet. We were still under British rule. Uh, Candia was a newly emerging community uh, carved out of a dense forest. Its roads were just mere horse trails. Uh, the inhabitants were scattered all around, uh, but they needed a place for uh, town business and a place to worship. So they constructed a, ba a barn-like structure um, for good reason. They, it was quick, easy, and they, they, knew, they knew the construction method. So it made, it made perfect sense. If we move the calendar up to the 1830s, now America was a vastly different uh, uh, place. America was now its own country. It had weathered the storm with the American Revolution, the War of 1812. It had just won the Mexican-American War. Um, Martin Van Buren was the eighth president. Uh, patriotism and enthusiasm all across the land was very, very high. The uh, first railroads started to appear in New England, and this was the seeds to the coming Industrial Revolution that would propel America to even further greatness. The church had changed, too. Uh, in, by the 1830s, the, the church was uh, uh, a busy place. The, the, it was... America was in the middle of the, of the second revival, and so people were clamoring to come to church, and churches all across America were swelling in size. So the church of the 1760s was focused on, on family and community, whereas the church in the 1830s was now mission-focused. So it was, it was going beyond its local borders and, and sending people uh, abroad to other parts of the country, other parts of the world. And these, these new activities required uh, money. And so the church, the church building of old wasn't going to work by the 1830s. So... Um, uh, some of the changes that were made were, were this church is a purpose-built church. It was designed specifically for the Congregationalist Society as a place to worship, as a place to teach and raise their kids, and a place for fellowship for the Congregationalist Society. The Methodists and the Baptists and that, they had their own churches. And so that was a big change from back in the 1760s. Now, in order to build a bigger church or to accommodate the needs of uh, uh, the, the new modern church of the 1830s, we needed a bigger space. And so this sanctuary here is a big, wide open space. So how did they do that? It's not a barn. It's not a barn like structure at all. This is a big, wide open space. They took a, a piece of engineering called a, a wood truss. And a wood truss is a, is a engineered fabrication of wood components in such a way that allows it to span great distances and carry heavy loads. The first wood trusses were invented in, in Europe back in the 1300s, but they were big, heavy, and expensive. But American ingenuity uh, created a truss that was lighter, cheaper, and faster and easier to build. And this, this engineering came right out of the emerging bridge industry. So a bridge builder wants to cross a river using the, the fewest number of bridge piers possible. The wood truss enabled him to do that. By building fewer bridge piers, you can reduce the cost of the bridge and uh, speed its construction. So some smart person said, well, let's take that Let's take that piece of engineering and put it up in the ceiling of our new church. Now we can spread the walls outward, we can raise the ceiling, and we can get rid of all the supporting posts that a barn-like structure would have. 
So by removing the, uh, uh, the, the supporting post here, we can fit more people in, generate more money, and there's a clear line of sight now to the altar. By creating a bigger space, we have much better acoustics. A bigger space has a feeling of grandeur, and that's important back in the 1830s for worshiping God. We could put in bigger windows. Bigger windows not only bring in more light, but, but improve the ventilation, the comfort of the, of the congregation here because we can exit the hot air through the top of the windows and we can bring in cool air at the bottom of the windows. In the 1830s, people wanted to worship in comfort. Back in the 1760s, with the very traditional Puritanism and Calvinistic ways, um, they didn't allow any kind of heating system in the church. The feeling was that uh, a fire was the devil's tool and you didn't want that in a church. So for the first 40 years of that church across the street, they had no heating system. People would bring in heated rocks and, and heat their, warm their feet with it. By the 1830s, people said, no, 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 we, we want to worship in comfort. So the bigger windows greatly uh, uh, improved the, the comfort. And in the summertime, this sanctuary is a pleasant place to be, not by accident, but by design. Also, by spreading out the walls and raising the ceiling now, we can construct balconies and lofts and have people worshiping on multi-levels. Now, this church doesn't have any balconies, but churches constructed in the 1830s like this had balconies and lofts. This church has a very nice loft. That was, a, that was very much a state-of-the-art thing back in the 1830s, is having people worshiping on different, different levels. Back in the 1760s, uh, the church had what they called uh, family boxes. And the church would raise money by leasing out space inside the church here to families. And this is how they would raise money. Back in the 1760s, that made perfect sense. They, they could raise enough money to do what they wanted. So a box would, would uh, have perimeter seating, the adults would face the altar, and the children would face the, the, uh, the adults. This church, by, or a church in the 1830s, got rid of those uh, uh, antiquated boxes because it couldn't generate enough money and replaced them with uh, what they, straight lines of what they called pew boxes. A pew box was similar to this pew, but it was more of a wall back here. This church had 77 rows of pew boxes with everybody facing forward to the altar. They realized that they could pass around the offering plate and generate a sufficient amount of money for the church. So the idea of building balconies and lofts and, and that was all about getting more people into the church and generating more money. This church also had a, uh, a unique innovation. It's called a basement. You say, Rob, what's the big deal with a basement? But a, a, a structure this size, digging a basement in the, uh, digging a foundation in the rocky ground in New Hampshire was a big deal. But the basement served several uh, useful purposes. Number one, the basement gave uh, the church a safe and dedicated space to cook and serve food. You know, churches love to cook food, and this church really knows how to cook food. The basement also gave a secondary uh, space for fellowship. So we're, we're worshiping on multi-levels, lofts, the sanctuary, the basement. Uh, we had to fit people in any way we could. But maybe the most interesting was the basement provided a, a space, a safe and dedicated space for the new state-of-the-art heating system, a full-fledged furnace. This church was not going to have a wood stove sitting in the middle here. If you recall, that church across the street built back in the 1760s, once they did decide to put a, uh, two wood stoves in there, that church eventually burned to the ground in January of 1838. They weren't, when they rebuilt this church, they weren't going to have any of that. So they put a, a state-of-the-art heating system in the basement and designed it in such a way that it was safe. 
But the idea, too, was that people wanted to worship in comfort. They didn't want to come to, to church in January and freeze. They wanted to be warm. They wanted to be warm in the winter and cool in the summer. So these are some of the innovative uh, uh, things that this church had. The church across the street burned in January of 1838. They broke ground for this church uh, in March of 1838. The Congregationalist Society themselves dug the foundation and, and framed the walls. And then they hired a project manager from Concord, New Hampshire, and he, he was hired to finish the church. Now that was important because a long-standing European tradition in the old church was that we're not going to finish construction of the church. That church was not deemed finished for 60 years. Well, when this church came around, they wanted, to, they wanted this church built to completion because they had church functions that they wanted to, to do. They had missions. They didn't want the loose ends of a, a, a church that wasn't all the way complete. Um, to deal with. They wanted a finished church. So in the first Sunday, or the first week of November 1838 was dedication day for this church. And this church opened its doors 100% complete. And when I say 100% complete, that means there was curtains on the wall, there was cushions on the pew, everything was painted, that new state-of-the-art heating system was fired up in all its glory, and the bell was in its tower, ringing away. On dedication day, hundreds and hundreds of people came, uh, and it was a big deal. There was uh, choirs and music ensembles inside, outside, upstairs, downstairs. It was a big day, and it was a big day for Candia. Candia had a state-of-the-art modern church. Thank you for listening. Have a great day. God bless.